Hi there, I'm Savannah Mextra with Manor Law Group, and I'm excited to welcome you to our very first Webinar Wednesday event. Today's webinar will offer an estate planning update in light of the uncertainty caused by coronavirus, and is hosted by certified elder law attorney, Robert Manor. Before I pass the torch to Bob, I'd like to just cover a few housekeeping details. Uh, first of all, a little disclaimer. Uh, while this event, this webinar is going to be informative, educational, um, you are gonna learn some things. Um, it does not count as legal advice. So if you are looking for legal advice, be sure to contact us after the webinar. Um, also, remember that today's webinar is recorded. We will send out a replay link later this week, probably Friday, that you can watch again and share with family and friends. Also, be sure that you put any questions you have in the chat box. We are planning to review questions at the end of today's webinar. So if we don't get to your question, um, we will contact you after the webinar. Now, why should you listen to the folks at Manor Law Group and what we have to say? So uh, I do want you to know that we are nationally recognized um, and respected as an elder law and estate planning firm. All three of our attorneys are accredited by the Veterans Administration to assist veterans with claims and appeals. Um, also, attorney Bob Manor is nationally board certified as an elder law attorney by the National Elder Law Foundation. He is one of only 19 attorneys in Michigan to achieve this designation. Bob is a leader among elder law attorneys in Michigan. He is currently on the executive board of the State Bar of Michigan Elder Law and Disability Rights Section and past president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, Michigan chapter. And Manor Law Group has been honored by readers of our local paper as the best or favorite law firm for the last eight years in a row. So without further ado, I would like to welcome attorney Bob Manor. Hi folks. All right, I really appreciate you joining us today. I see that there's a lot of our friends uh, on the broadcast today. And uh, for those of you, I think there are a number of things that uh, the current environment you need to be updated on. If uh, you're not currently working with us, then there's gonna be plenty for you to think about as far as getting your uh, ducks in a row and get things ready for whatever might happen. And, uh, and now is as good a time as any, in fact, probably a better time uh, to make sure that we have uh, the basic things in place. So here's the basic agenda for today. And so let's see if we can do both of these at the same time. Um, the idea is, hold on. <laughs> Okay, so uh, basically I wanna talk a little bit about why good planning is very important right now. There are things going on that it is gonna be crucial that we have uh, plans in place. We always say <clears throat> that we never really know what's gonna happen to any of us, but now more than ever, we need to make sure that we have uh, the proper orders in place, proper things in place, and we're going to talk to you about how to make sure that that can happen even in our current environment. And that's the next thing is how to get good legal planning or uh, updates to your existing planning even under the current environment because there are some challenges. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for us to sit face to face and for us to sign legal documents and we'll get into all of that and, and how we're going to proceed with that to make sure that we can still take care of everybody. Um, <clears throat> there are some crucial legal planning that's needed now. Now, a lot of our clients, you're already going to have the basics in place. If you're not a client, we can help you get those basics in place. We're going to talk about what are those critical basic legal plans that you need in any circumstances that you need to make sure that you have no matter what uh, your stage in life is and why it's critical critical that we don't just use a one size fit all or fill in the blank form. Those forms are almost always gonna create more harm than good. And we're gonna talk about what's really important to get done and how to get it done. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about Medicare and Medicaid. For a lot of the folks that we're helping, they're gonna be over 65 and they're worried about, you know, how is this gonna affect their, their benefits? What if we ever had a nursing home type of a situation? How is this gonna affect Medicaid? And there are some changes in the, that have just occurred with regard to emergency orders and all of that, which will affect uh, some of our options with regard to Medicare, Medicaid, and the next issue, which is taxes. So we'll go through all of that. 
Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about is are there any free options? And so if any of you have followed us before, you know that we're offering uh, some free legal documents to folks. Understand free legal documents are do not take the place of uh, good legal planning and good legal advice. They are temporary measures just to get you by. And I, I would highly recommend that you could every consideration to doing a real legal plan because this is about everything that you've worked so hard for. This is about your life, your health, your savings, everything, your family. And we need to have make sure that we have proper plans in place for that. So we can do those free legal plans if it's absolutely necessary. And we're going to even institute a way of possibly helping you sign some of those free legal documents. But please understand. This is just a temporary measure, and please don't use this as a, an excuse for not doing real legal planning because you're going to be, just be putting yourselves in uh, not a good position under that situation. And then we're going to talk to you about what you can do now. So at the end of the meeting, Savannah is going to go through and we're going to send you a link as far as setting up a meeting with us. Uh, we're going to uh, send you a calendar where you can actually schedule your own meeting right on the calendar, right on the computer. Uh, we're going to have an option of just contacting us if you have a question. And of course, phone calls. Now, phone calls are a little bit more limited because we're under this stay at home order, just like everybody else. And so we're all active. We're all working remotely and we've figured it out. We've got all the technology in place, so we figured it out. Um, but uh, the phones are a little bit more challenging. So if you can contact us through either setting up an appointment on the calendar we're going to send you or uh, clicking the button to contact us, that's going to be a little bit easier for us. But of course, anytime uh, you need to call us, we're still answering our phones. You just might have to, depending on how many people are calling at that time, you might have to leave a message and then we'll call you back the same day. Um, so this, this is all uh, really important. We're going to get right into it. I do want to mention that we probably will have time to take some questions at the end and Savannah will read me those questions and we will, uh, you'll have an opportunity to type those in. There should be a box uh, right off to the side there. And if you have the box off to the side, then you should be able to type in a question. And uh, there's also might be a comment box there. So if you can type in that question, that will, um, Savannah will uh, try to get that and we'll address that uh, before the end of the hour. And if uh, we don't get to your question, we will try to get back to you individually one-on-one. -on -one. All right, having said that, let's get right into this. Uh, Savannah already talked about the disclaimer. None of this can be considered legal advice. Obviously, what we talk about here is going to be general uh, knowledge and uh, things that we need to uh, convey to you, but you should not consider it legal advice. All right, so why, do we, why is it more important than ever to make sure you have good legal planning in place? Now, again, I want to be very clear. If you're a client of ours and we've done a comprehensive plan for you, we should have everything in place. That doesn't mean that you might not want some updates. And there's actually some specific things that we're going to talk about as regard to healthcare planning and things like that, that we may consider wanting to update those documents. But um, if uh, you have the basics in place, there might be some updates that we want to do based on the current environment. But uh, be assured, any of the documents I talk about today are going to be uh, things that we would have covered as part of your comprehensive planning. Uh, it is extremely important for you to understand that good legal planning is not just documents, okay? Documents, of course, are important, but documents are tools. And if we don't know how to use the tools properly or if they are the wrong tool for the purpose, it's not going to help us. And so I, you know, many of you have heard me say from time to time, it's, uh, I don't charge for the documents, I charge for the advice. And the, it really is a, a, a lot of truth for that. Um, the, the documents itself are not going to be appropriate under the circumstances. And so let me give you an example of this just to, to kind of prove my point. And there's a there's hundred examples I could come up, come up with why just filling in the blank, filling in the blank documents are not going to be sufficient. Here's an example. A lot of times well, people are real concerned right now about their healthcare document, okay? Sometimes we look at it as like an end of life document. In other words, do I want to be on life support? Do I want to be connected to machines? 
Well, a lot of us in a different age, in a different day would have said, no, I don't want to be, you know, kept alive on machines if there's not a good chance of recovery or things like that. And so some of the documents out there, not ours, but some of the documents that are out there, especially a lot of the form documents will say, don't incubate me, don't incubate. In other words, don't uh, don't put me on a respirator. The problem is, of course, now we're I uh, have this uh, coronavirus and if things get bad, that could save our lives that, you know, and, and the potential of recovering from that and having a full recovery. But if your documents are, you know, so you find sign some form documents that say, don't incubate me, then, um, or it might use different language in there, it might not use the word incubate, then uh, that's not gonna be appropriate under these circumstances. And so it is one of those things that, um, we, I don't recommend form documents. I'm gonna tell you in a, bit, a minute about how we can do a couple of those form documents if we absolutely have to, but those I really think should be temporary until you can get some real documents done. Um, this is about your health, your life, your life savings, and they're worth more than just hodgepodge piece together planning and or one size fits all plans. A lot of times people come into me and they say, okay, well, everything should be fine because I've got uh, my daughter on this account and I've got a beneficiary designation on this account and I've got this deed in my pocket or in the drawer. That's hodgepodge planning that uh, I get paid lots of money over the years for fixing that, for fixing the planning of people that thought they had everything covered because they had a different plan for everything. They had a, a joint owner on one account and they had a beneficiary designation on another account and they had a deed in the drawer somewhere. A lot of people don't realize the consequences of all of those and sometimes that how uh, your property taxes can go up when we file that deed or that the you know beneficiaries are going to die in the wrong order or if you have somebody's uh, name on something that their uh, your assets are exposed to problems that they have or healthcare problems that they have your your assets could be exposed because something happens to your children a lot of times we say oh well you know i'm older i'm not in as good as health as my children but nowadays, this is, oh, everything's changing. And we it's really a bad idea to have this hodgepodge of planning where we put people's names on some assets and we do this on other assets. A comprehensive plan is really more important. And that's what we do. We wanna make sure that we have a plan that covers everything, that we're not saying, oh, put your kids' names on it. I don't know how many times people have come back to me and said, uh, they have, they've gotten a really good plan. So they've got, we've got a comprehensive plan for them. And they call me a couple of years later and they say, well, I was talking to my sister, I was talking to my friend and she was concerned because I don't have my daughter's name on my account. Or she was concerned because she doesn't have my daughter's name on my deed. Well, you shouldn't have your daughter's name on your account and you shouldn't have your daughter's name on your deed. That is going to most of the time cause more problems, more tax issues, more liability issues, more problems all the way around than having the, your your plan used as as it's intended and so this is really important and that's um not what people do when they do hodgepodge planning you know where they're just planning for each asset and most of the time people will forget things so people call us all the time we have a whole department in our law firm to deal with this where people died and they thought they had everything covered and it's it's not covered and we end up having to go through probate and go through this long drawn out process so um, now it's more important than ever because uh, we need to be prepared for the unexpected. I can't even, it's hard to even fathom that it was just over, you know, not even a week and a half ago that we had the stay at home order. It seems like so much has happened and in the last two weeks uh, we made plans and then everything changed each day. Uh, there was a, a different thing each day and so yeah, there's just so much to be unexpected and we don't know how long this is going to last or how long this is going to go for who's going to get sick and who's not going to get sick. And the bottom line is we need to be able to be prepared for everything. And that's what a comprehensive plan does. That's, that's what a comprehensive plan does. Um, many, many times people come into my office and they say, well, I think I need to change my plan because of this circumstance changed or this person got sick or this person became disabled or this person died. And we look at the plan and it already addresses that because a comprehensive plan is going to think about not just how the world is today, but what might happen tomorrow. What happens after that? What happens after that? Some of you have kind of laughed at me or made fun of me when I ask you some questions during our drafting process. And I say, well, what happens if they die or what happens if they're not around? And I keep going on and on and on until we make sure that we have a plan for everything. But that's what comprehensive planning means. And in today's day and age, what's happened over the last couple of weeks here, I think we need to have the backup plans in place. So just be aware of that. Um, 
one of the things that's really important why planning now is more important than ever and why there might be some needs for some changes for your existing plan is we definitely do not want to end up in the court system right now. Most of the courts are closed. Um, they're closed except for emergency matters. And so it's there's going to be harder and harder to get into the courts. And so if we end up having to go into court because we need a medical decision, made. You know, if you don't have the proper legal documents in place, it might the, the hospital might not be able to do what needs to be done without a someone uh, being able to say make decisions for you. Okay, it's not like it was 20 years ago where they would just go to your family and say, "Well, your 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 mom or your dad is uh, your spouse is sick. They can't say what they want. Why don't you tell us what they would want?" That's not the way things work anymore, okay? For the most part, hospitals need somebody who's legally appointed to be able to make medical decisions. And if we don't have that in place, this could end up in the courts. Well, with the courts basically closed, this could be long delays, it could be overwhelmed by the courts. It's just, it's this is, this is why I'm giving out free documents right now, because I don't want to have anybody not have the ability to plan for this. Um, and it's against our best interest, obviously, to give out these free documents and even help we're, if we can. We'll talk about this in a second. We're going to if the governor allows us to do this, we're going to even help you sign some of these free documents uh, at no cost. And the only reason I'm doing that is because I just don't want anybody to be end up where it's uh, we're having to wait for a judge to make a decision about life and death. That's just the worst case scenario for me. Of course, the uh, possibility of guardianships, probate after death, and access to the assets by the spouse or family. A lot of times people think, oh, well, I don't have to worry about that because we have everything joint. Okay, well, are you sure? <laughs> because retirement accounts are not joint. IRAs, 401ks, uh, qualified annuities, there's anything that's considered a retirement account, a Roth IRA, are individual accounts. They are not joint accounts. And if you don't have proper legal documents in place or a court order, spouse is not going to be able to access that. Clearly, kids are not going to be able to access it. It doesn't matter if they're beneficiaries on it. Okay, They might be a beneficiary, but if you're alive and sick and we need to access that, we can't do that without proper legal documents or a court order. And then things like the house. You say, well, we're both on the house. That should be fine. Well, not necessarily. What if we need to, I don't know how long this is gonna last for. What if we need to do something with the house? What if we wanna downsize on the house? What if we wanna sell or mortgage the house or get a reverse mortgage, whatever it is, we need two signatures on that. What if one of you can't sign? So these are really important things. It's not automatic. People just kind of assume these things are gonna be automatic and they, they don't have to worry about that because they're married and they, they think they have everything joint. We still need to have those basic legal documents in place. It's so important in, in the unpredictable future as, as we are right here. All right, so here's the big thing. Here's the big change that, you know, a lot of you have these legal documents, but here's the big change. How do we get the good advice? And how do we get these documents signed? So most of you, um, uh, if you've come to see me or you heard me speak, I like to sit and talk to people. I like to sit at the table with somebody. I think it's easier to give advice, easier to communicate, easier to have an understanding of what your under, your experience is and what your life circumstances are to sit face to face. And we're not going to be able to do that for a while. So we have uh, a number of technologies that we're going to use. And so I know some of my clients, they are uh, not big on technology. They're not big on email and using computers and things like that. And here's my promise to you. We'll figure it out. Some, one way or the other, we'll figure it out so that we can still have that conversation. We can still give that advice. For the ones that are more comfortable with computers, we've, we, we're going to use every possible option. We've been using GoToMeeting. We can use Facebook uh, Live. We can do, um, if you have an iPhone, we can do FaceTime. We can do Zoom. We can do, there are a million different options out there, and we have access to all of them. And so whatever's going to be most convenient. We're going to have a preferred way. And we're going to do the way that we think is going to be easiest for you. But if you are, for some reason, it doesn't work on your computer, it doesn't work on your phone, whatever else, we'll find another way. That's my promise to you. If you are not comfortable with the, you know, you don't like to do it with the computer stuff, we'll figure out a way to do it one way or the other. Um, I think about how much um, our, our little phones have affected our lives in the last few years. So, uh, you know, none of us had smartphones 
I don't know how many years ago, but everybody does. It doesn't matter whether we have computers or we're great with email or anything like that. Almost everybody has those smartphones still. I know a few of you still have flip phones, but most everybody has those smartphones still. And we can use that. So now the nice thing is we'll be able to use that and that will be that can be the technology that we use. And uh, if you don't have a computer, or don't like using computers, we'll figure it out using your phone. Or if you don't have either of those, we'll figure out some other way. That's that's. Don't worry about that. That's my job, and it might be a little bit more challenging uh, for some folks, but uh, don't worry about that. And those folks that are are comfortable with that, that really prefer to just have a button to push and say, "Okay, give me legal advice." That's great. Uh, we're we're more than open to to that, and we'll help you with that. The bigger issue now is how do we get these documents signed? So in an emergency, we've got uh, a few different options. We can, the, the laws in Michigan do not allow for most of our legal documents to be signed remotely. Whereas you can do that for uh, real estate, you can do that for mortgages, you can do it for just about every other industry out there where they send you a link and you just sign the documents with the computer. They currently do not allow that in Michigan. So some of you may know, I was appointed as a co-chairman of a committee to deal with the governor's office, deal with the Supreme, Court's office, uh, Supreme Court, and start talking to key legislators to try to get that changed. So that's been uh, a lot of what I've been doing the last week and a half is, uh, two weeks, is uh, trying to work mostly with the governor's office right now to try to, and I've got a great committee of other lawyers that have just been fantastic and really have uh, drafted some great language and very compelling case. We do believe that the governor's office is currently reviewing it. The last I heard, I was hoping I'd have an announcement today at the at the webinar, but the last I heard it is with the uh, one of the governor's um, uh, chief of staff type people and uh, that their final reviews and it seems like it's been reviewed by everybody else and I'll tell you this has been quite a journey to get this uh, executive order signed. So the executive order that we're expecting and hoping for is going to allow us to sign these crucial legal documents and you can do it from your home. You don't have to come in, you don't have to um, you know, we don't have to be physically present in the same room with you to notarize documents, to witness documents. Now that's not the law yet, but we're hoping that we're gonna get an executive order. And I'm working with the committee because the executive order is only gonna be temporary. I'm working with the committee to uh, draft legislation that we will take to key legislators uh, that have been working with us to try to make this a permanent rule because every other industry allows for this. Uh, and we, we really need to have this for people in the hospital, people confined, people in quarantine, all of these types of things, we need to have an ability for them to sign these crucial legal documents like you know, medical decisions and, and life support decisions and those types of things. So we expect to have that. I would have, I hoped we would have had it by now, but we expect to have it any day. Uh, it's anybody is interested in a, in a long story someday, you wanna sit down with me, I'll tell you the story of, of trying to get an executive order passed because it's been a, a, a roller coaster to say the least uh, with uh, all the different, um, it's the reason I could never be a politician or a lobbyist because there, it was it was just a roller coaster with all the people putting their input in and trying to make sure that we're satisfying everybody and and still protecting seniors and making sure there's no elder abuse and all of those types of things and we think we've crafted a really good uh, potential order and really good legislation and uh, like I say it could be any minute right now that the governor would issue that order but we really do hope and think that it will be sometime this week. Once that's done, we are we are all set to start signing those legal documents. Okay, we've we've practiced it, we've got it all done, we're ready so that we can sign those legal documents for you. If there was an emergency, if there was something that had to happen prior to uh, that executive order, best we're going to be able to do is we'll have you drive into the parking lot. We'll meet you there because we're not even in the parking in the office uh, very often, but we'll meet you there. We'll have the notary there. We'll have gloves on. You hand us the, the, the forms or we'll hand them to you. You sign them. You use your own pen. Hand them back to us. We'll, we'll figure this out in an emergency. But the idea is uh, hopefully we won't have to do that soon. So like I say, I was hoping even uh, before we spoke today that we would have that option, but it's not quite there. All right. So what are the crucial legal documents that we're talking about now? These are the things that really 
everybody should have. Now, the trust is a question. Not everybody needs a trust, but pretty much all the rest of these, if you've got people you love, then you should have these documents. And when I say you've got people you love, I should say you've got people you love and you trust because we have to have people that we trust to appoint. And I'd rather have you not have somebody appointed than have the wrong person appointed, right? We don't want to have um, somebody that we question whether they're trustworthy or not, or whether they'll make the decisions the way that we'd want them to make the decisions. And I know that's a tough thing to say. You know, we, we have a relative, but if we don't have complete faith in them and, and trust, we might love them like crazy, but if we don't have faith that they would make the right decision, we got to pick somebody else. I'd rather have you not have any documents or not have anybody appointed and then I'm getting in line at the court and seeing what happens there than having you put, uh, appoint the wrong person. And that's that's really crucial and really important. It doesn't always have to be the oldest. It doesn't always have to be the person who's loudest. It doesn't always have to be the person who lives next door to you. It's going to be the person who's um, most uh, trustworthy, able, and willing. And willing is one of those big ones. A lot of times people will appoint their uh, child that lives next door, but that child lives next door isn't willing. Uh, and the one that lives in California is willing. And so we got to think about that. And so those, these are tough things. And this is stuff that we walk you through. We're going to talk you through. We're going to ask you questions. We're going to kind of help you make these decisions. So uh, be aware of that. So these are the crucial things. And uh, you see on, on the side there that I say that unless absolutely necessary, in an emergency, none of these documents should be fill in the blank forms. This is something I've been doing this for what now 25 years i guess well not quite close to 25 years and i've had my own law office for 20 years and uh i don't know how many times that we've had problem after problem with people having fill in the blank documents um they one size does not fit all now i would honestly especially when it comes to healthcare and things as long as you're you know conscious of it and you're thinking about it and you're taking it seriously i'd rather have you have something uh, for healthcare decisions than nothing. And that's why I'm offering those documents. But uh, the bottom line is it, these are important issues. People don't realize uh, how much goes into this thinking. And I've spent 25 years thinking about it and thinking about what are the questions to ask and thinking about how do I ask to make sure that the, you're, you're, you understand the decisions that you're making and you're making the right decisions and you're doing the thing that's going to make it easier for your spouse and your family and make it easier for you and get make it so that you get what you need okay so the first one of course is the patient advocate sometimes we call that a uh, health care power of attorney sometimes we call in other states they call it a living will we don't really use living wills in Michigan so much but uh, sometimes they're called that so patient advocate or health care power of attorney um, these are very important documents anybody over 18 yeah, again, if you got somebody you love and somebody you trust, you should have a patient advocate or healthcare power of attorney. This is not the same as a financial power of attorney. Okay, that's a separate document. In Michigan, they have to be separate documents because there's different standards on which they are used. Okay, and you, uh, for example, the patient advocate can only be used and only be triggered uh, when you are not capable of making your own decision. So what the law says is you always make your own healthcare decisions, period. Doesn't matter if you sign one of these documents or not, you always make your own healthcare decisions, okay? And that's really important. So if you're, if the doctors feel you're competent to make that decision, if you're conscious to make that decision, you always make those decisions, all right? It doesn't matter if you have a patient advocate or healthcare power of attorney. So in Michigan and most states, the patient advocate healthcare power of attorney only takes effect after typically two doctors would have to, have to say that you're not capable of making that decision. And then, uh, then the person you've appointed ha can make that decision. And that's what we do in Michigan. In other states, you can actually sign a document that says, under these conditions, don't you know do life support or things like that. In Michigan, you can have that too, but Michigan law calls for you to appoint somebody to convey your wishes for you. And that's what this document is. Um, I mentioned this uh, that there might be some updates or changes in the event of, in light of uh, coronavirus. There's a couple of key things that come to mind, and one is the the um, being incubated. We talked about that that respirator situation. Some documents I've seen out there that say you don't want to be incubated, don't want to have a respirator, don't want to be kept on that for any period of time, or sometimes they put limits on that. 
it's one of those things that under these circumstances this is this might be changed we might we might want to specifically say in there that we would want to be incubated for the purposes of treating coronavirus i mean we could be that specific if you'd like us to um but that's really important to make sure that there's clarity there and some of you have seen some um uh, information put out by some of the hospitals and things like that that they're trying to figure out how to make sure that the uh, that they've got enough for everybody and that they might institute some policies well I certainly want the folks that we're working with to have clarity that they if they want to be incubated that they aren't pushed into a position where they're forced not to be incubated and not to use a respirator so that's something to consider the other things that we've uh, looked at possibly uh, changing or adding to those documents is uh, something that says that your uh, appointed person the person you appointed to convey your wishes for you doesn't have to be physically present to convey those wishes that they could do it over the phone or over video or whatever else um, you know, probably not necessary to do that, but in these days, you never know. They might not be able to be physically present in the era of quarantine. And so, uh, so you know, that's a possible thing that we might want to add to those documents too. So, um, plus, again, the form documents might not really have the language that we really want there. The next one is uh, what we call the, the financial power of attorney. Sometimes they call it the durable power of attorney. Is this for legal and financial matters? Now, this one does not have to, this one can take effect even when you're not incapacitated. And that's actually what I recommend is that we have documents that say that when I sign this, the person I appointed, they would have the ability to make decisions for me. They'd be able to have the ability to write a check for me. Because sometimes you might be in the hospital and it's very difficult for you to get your bills paid or things like that. But it's you're not incapacitated so we can't say you know have it triggered because of incapacity when you're not incapacitated it's just really inconvenient for you to be able to do your banking and to do your financial things so i like those to be effective immediately some people say well isn't that dangerous now i'm appointing somebody who would be able to write a check for me and my answer for that is if you don't trust them then that's not the right person period if you don't think that you could trust them today to have that authority then we're picking the wrong person OK, and so that's that's how high of a standard my old law school professor used to call these a license to steal. <laughs> now, just because you have a license to steal doesn't mean you're going to steal. But in other words, it's a document that says somebody else can pull money out of your account, can move money around, can do all of these other things. And so one of the things we have here is these uh, extraordinary powers. This is different than most people's documents. So if you've got a form document or even a document drafted by other really capable and qualified lawyers, they often do not have these things we call extraordinary powers. And I've got an example here of extraordinary powers. So typically we use these extraordinary powers uh, in a situation where somebody's sick or somebody's going into a nursing home, uh, somebody maybe needs veterans benefits or Medicaid benefits. As many of you probably know, the costs of nursing home now are incredibly high. The cost of assisted living, of home care, all of that is incredibly high. And so there are ways, this is one of the things that we do, this is one of the practice areas that we have, and there's not that many lawyers that do this type of thing. We help you protect assets uh in the in, and still qualify for government benefits so if you've ever heard medicaid is only for people that only have no money well then you know the bottom line is medicaid can pay for a nursing home um and so if we have these extraordinary powers in your documents then for a married couple i can usually there's some exemptions and there's some safe harbors for married couples that if we are able to maximize that we can often protect everything in favor of a married in favor of the healthy spouse the non-nursing home spouse the non-incapacitated spouse protect 100 percent of the assets the house and everything else now if it's a single person we can sometimes protect everything but uh, we can at least protect about half of the assets the house plus about half of the assets but i can't do any of that i can't do either of those things unless i either have those extraordinary powers laid out in the uh in the durable power of attorney or i get a court order and so we know about going into court these days is, is going to be kind of difficult so why isn't this if this is extraordinary you know why is it extraordinary why aren't these in everybody's documents and the answer is what's the extraordinary nature of it well it's extraordinary because we're giving more authority than we normally would in a power of attorney in a legal document we're even giving the authority to move assets out of our name if it's necessary to protect it 
to qualify for those benefits so we don't lose everything. That's another word for moving assets out of our name. <laughs> if we didn't have it be with somebody that is trustworthy and loving and doing the right thing for us and trying to protect us, then uh, we, you know, it could be considered stealing. And so outsiders looking in might say that it looks like stealing. So we need to have that language in there. And if it's not in there, we really can't do it. We can't transfer assets uh, to protect them, even between married couples sometimes. Even between married couples, we can't, uh, we can't uh, uh, transfer assets to protect them. And so it's real important that we have this language. And so if you have uh, legal documents and we didn't draft them, then that's something you might want to consider having us add to those documents. So um go back on that so that's the extraordinary powers uh we're going to talk a little bit about the will in a second uh a will one of the things uh people have asked me about well, you know where can i get a will well you call us this is not i really don't recommend the online wills the fill in the blank wills um in my 25 years uh i can tell you probably over a thousand times that i've seen those done and they were done uh in not and I say wrongly, and I say wrong, they, they did not accomplish the goal that the person filling it out thought that they accomplished, okay? They filled it out, maybe they filled it out to the, uh, to, to, based on the instructions that they got with it, but it didn't accomplish what they wanted it to accomplish. They didn't, uh, the final result was not what they thought it would be. And I have, I probably have a thousand examples in my career of that. So a will is not something, this is too serious. This is everything you have. This is everything that you, you know, uh, want to be able to pass on and things like that. It's too serious to, um, to just use a, a fill in the blank form, frankly. The trust is a different thing. So the will, uh, one of the things you know about a will is it does have to go through probate. So if we have to look at a will, we got to open up probate. We're going to talk a little bit about more about that in a second here. A trust is designed not to go through probate, but you're going to see in a second why a lot of think people that have a trust still go through probate. So I'm going to say that again. A lot of people that paid good money to a lawyer for a trust still go through probate. And so I have a slide on that I'm going to explain in a second. And then these final last two ones, a lot of people are very familiar with this HIPAA law, right? The HIPAA law is the healthcare privacy law, and you've probably signed one of these HIPAA waivers lots and lots of times anytime you go to a new doctor anytime you've been to the hospital anytime you i mean you've probably signed it many many times i like you to have one on uh, file so that if you're not capable of signing go to the hospital the hospital doesn't have one you're not capable of signing it lays out very clearly who you would want to uh, have them share your medical information with okay they passed this law 13 14 years ago whatever it was and uh, they, it now says technically that you're not supposed to share information about your medical situation, even with your spouse or your kids or things like that. So we want to make sure if there's people that you would want them to be able to ask questions and be in the room with you, that we have that HIPAA waiver. Now, um, the government has waived some of the HIPAA regulations now under this new executive order, under this new crisis, but not all of them. So I still think it's really important to have that HIPAA waiver. And then this new thing, this funeral designation, this is primarily just to make things easier after you're gone. This is not about pre-paying the funeral or things like that. It's trying to make sure that if you want certain things to happen, that you've appointed someone who would be able to sign the arrangements with the funeral home. Even if you prearranged your funeral, if you don't have this new funeral designation, it's only been in law for the last couple of years, uh, then they might have to track down a bunch of relatives and they all have to agree or a majority of them have to agree in order to make sure that your wishes are followed. So with this funeral designation, uh, it just simplifies that process, makes sure your wishes are followed. So talked about the durable power of attorney for finances. I want to talk about the last will and testament planning. So this is perfectly fine. We will do this for lots of folks. They say, okay, look, uh, I just want to make sure I have all the things in place. So we're going to do a will. We're going to do uh, a, a healthcare document. We're going to do the funeral designation. We're going to do the power of attorney. We're going to do the HIPAA waiver. We're going to do all of these things. But I just want you to know when we do that, that the will is the primary document that uh, is going to go through probate okay so if we have to look at the will to see if something goes through probate then uh, i mean if we have to look at the will to see where something goes 
then it has to go through probate. So that's why a lot of people prefer to do trust planning. But if you're saying, look, I don't want to pay extra for trust planning, it'll cost more in the long run to go through probate. But if you're young and healthy and you say, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to take my chances right now, that's perfectly fine. And it's, it's certainly a lot better planning than not having planning right so it's a lot better planning and in, in, in your will you can say who's going to raise your children who's going to manage the money and who's going to do all these things unfortunately it just means all those things are going to be have to be activated by the probate court so uh is there ways to avoid probate of course there are you can use beneficiary designations payable on death transfer on death um you can use joint owners which i don't recommend because a joint owner means uh if they're on the account with you that means anything bad that happens to them financially happens to you too. So if you have your daughter on your account and she gets divorced, your money could be exposed to that divorce. If your daughter's on the account, she gets sued, your money could be exposed to that lawsuit. Doesn't pay a credit card bill, your money's exposed to that credit card bill. Get sick and requires nursing home care, your daughter, your daughter needs that or her spouse needs that or your, uh, your son needs that, you know, uh, and uh, or his spouse needs that then your money could be exposed to your child's or their spouse's nursing home care costs. That's why I say never put your kids' names on assets. That's a really bad idea. I know you do it for convenience. I know the bank tells you to do it. I don't think banks should be giving legal advice. The banks do it because they think it's convenient, it's good for the bank. It's not good for you. You should not put your kids' names on accounts, okay? Beneficiaries are better, but it doesn't, again, it's a little bit hodgepodge. It doesn't solve all of our problems. So the next step then is going to, of course, be this uh, the idea of the trust. Now, the idea of a trust, we often reference it as a wagon. It's because you got to put your stuff into the trust. Right? Once the trust is drafted and the lawyer gives you the trust, you got to go through each and every account and retitle that account or change the beneficiary designation to make sure it's going to be in the wagon or in the trust. This is very, very important. And this is why most people that have trust still end up having some of their assets go through probate. This is extremely common. Almost everybody that comes to see us that has a trust have some of their assets that would end up in probate if we didn't fix that, if we didn't correct that. So just because you have a trust doesn't mean you're not gonna go through probate. It means we gotta go through each and every asset and make sure that it's titled properly, that it has the right beneficiary designations and things like that. Most lawyers don't think of that as part of their services. They just draft the legal document and they hand it to you and say, okay, you figure it out from here. We're going to make sure that we can use, you know, that you're using that tool properly. So a, a trust can do a lot of things. And the main thing that people use it for is to avoid probate. That's a very good thing. But there's a couple other things I want to briefly mention to you just so that they're out there. We can do generational planning. And the generational planning says, okay, well, what happens to the money after you die? Well, we can have it where there's protections uh, for remarriage in case your spouse dies and, and then remarriage makes sure that uh, the money's still going to go to the kids. We can have provisions in there to make sure that the um, taxes on your retirement accounts uh, get minimized by stretching out those payments over. Now we can go up to 10 years or sometimes longer, depending on your circumstances. This is one of those things where there is no one size fits all, especially when it comes to retirement accounts. Retirement accounts are all going to be very, very specific based on your circumstances, who your beneficiaries are, and and you know how much is in there, what their ages are. There's so many different variables now when it comes to retirement accounts that this cannot be done with a fill-in-the-blank form. And um, if it is done with fill-in-the-blank form, the, the, there's a pretty darn good chance that you're going to end up paying extra taxes or more taxes than you otherwise would have had you done nothing. Um, so this can be done uh, when it comes to IRAs and retirement accounts and 401ks and all of that. This is where it really requires one-on-one -on -one advice. This is where this is where where it's worth it. This is one of the main reasons, or a big reason, not one of the main reasons, but a big reason why it's worth it. But also we can protect uh, in case after you die, your child gets divorced, your child gets into financial trouble, or gets in a lawsuit, or goes into a nursing home. We can protect that. Um, beyond that. So we have these lifetime protector trusts for the children. So that's what we call generational planning. And then I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Some, I just want to mention it to you because I know we've got a lot of clients on the phone. And some of you have done asset protection planning. Now, the idea of asset protection planning is a totally different type of trust. It's not your regular little red wagon trust. Sometimes we refer to it as a lockbox trust. But the idea of this trust is that it is designed to help you qualify for veterans benefits or Medicaid benefits 
if and when you need those, if you have a nursing home stay or needed home care or those types of things. Before I move on to uh, the next topic, I do want to address one thing. This is something I typically address in most of my public presentations. When I talk about protecting assets what, and, and, and qualifying for veterans benefits or qualifying for Medicaid, sometimes I get an objection to that. Sometimes people will say, okay, well, wait a second. I thought Medicaid were just for folks that don't, you know, that don't have anything that the, and, that, and that's what it's designed for. And I say, okay, well, my issue is this. If you had heart disease and you have to go in for a quadruple bypass surgery on your heart, who's going to pay for the bulk of that? The surgery, the rehab, the follow-up, all of the, the rehab afterwards, everything that goes on for a year and a half or, or longer, who pays for the bulk of it? It doesn't come out of your pocket. It's paid for by Medicare, all right? We say, okay, well, but yeah, I paid into Medicare, right? I paid every paycheck I ever got. They took some of it out for Medicare. Guess what else they took it out for? They took it out for Medicaid. Every single paycheck you've ever gotten, they took money out for Medicaid. And here's why I bring up Medicaid, because what happens is instead of you have heart disease, but if you have dementia or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, and what you require is not surgery, but long-term care. You need nursing home care, you need home care, those types of things. Guess how much Medicare is gonna pay for that? Almost zero. And so if you have one disease, the government's going to pay for almost all of it. If you have another disease, the government's going to pay for almost none of it. And they say, okay, no, you have to go broke. You have to lose your house. I mean, not lose your house, potentially lose your house with what we call a state recovery, but you have to lose just about everything, maybe even mostly impoverish your spouse, all these other things. So my job is to say, no, I'm going to equal that out. If we have one of those diseases that's not covered by Medicare and we can get Medicaid to cover it, and there's legal ways to do it, which there are, they wrote the law that way. They do this, right? I'm, I'm realizing this when we're trying to help draft these laws now for the uh, for signing legal documents. But they write the law and they make sure that there's uh, ways that can be used to help it. This is why sometimes we hear about really rich folks that don't pay any taxes because they know how to use the law to their advantage. Well, I think folks that aren't necessarily really rich but are sick and have a disease that they might not need to go broke or get impoverished as a result of that. And I know how to use the law legally, favorably to make sure that we can protect those assets. So that's what that's about. Okay, so how will all of this affect Medicare and Medicaid? Well, there's a few different things. Uh, one of the things, and I'm not sure how this is all gonna you know, roll out here, but one of the things I think is real important is <clears throat> um, many of you know that under traditional Medicare, you have to, if you want to go and get some rehab, paid for at the at a rehab facility, you have to spend three midnights at the hospital. You have to go to the hospital for three midnights. Well, they've waived that requirement under the executive order, under these current you know situations, current conditions. Um, one of the other things that is really interesting and, and can be very helpful is a lot of the nursing homes, or some of them actually, the majority in uh, places that do rehab, the majority, as in like 95% of the beds in rehab facilities are also long-term Medicaid beds. That's how they're licensed. Uh, but there's a percentage that are not. And so sometimes they can say, well, the bed you are in is not a Medicaid bed and you can't stay here longer than this you know, short period of time. Well, what the executive order said is they have waived that requirement. So if you're in a Medicare bed, if you're in a rehab bed under the law, they say that the facility can apply and, and get Medicaid for that, uh, you know, Medicaid dollars for that bed and it'll allow you to stay there longer. So that's, uh, that's going to be a real important aspect there. Um, there's going to be a number of things with regard to taxes. The one I thought was uh, particularly interesting is that there's no required minimum distributions this year. If, you're, if you've been around long enough and you've been old enough to take required minimum distributions long enough, you'll remember uh, they did this, uh, I think it was after 9-11. Or, or maybe it was after the 2008, um, but they, they had a year where you didn't have to pay required minimum distributions, okay? And that is the case for this year. There's not a requirement to pay required minimum distributions this year, so if you choose not to, the thought process on that is um, the stock market's kind of tanked, and so uh, they don't want you to have to take money out at a lower, you know, when, when the value of your accounts are lower. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not going to tell you if you should or shouldn't. That's that's a that's that's a whole different conversation. Okay. I just want you to know that you're not required to if you choose not to. 
um, are there any free options? So as many of you may have seen on one of my previous videos is that we uh, are we're looking for what can we do in this situation? What can we do in this process? And so we prepared a very, very basic, um, easy to use two forms that we can uh, get out to you, but there's very specific signature requirements. And right now we can't help you with those signature requirements. As soon as we get that governor's order, which we've been working on, I've been working night and day on this thing to get the governor to issue an executive order. And, and I, I, I fully believe she will do the, that. They've been working with us really, uh, really well. And it's been, it's the, with regard to the governor's office, it's been a very positive process. There's just been a lot of voices coming in from different directions, which has slowed it down a little bit. And that's all good too. That's which we want to make sure that we have the best uh, executive order that we can, but hopefully we get that. And then we can help you sign these free documents too. But right now, the two documents that I think are most important that everybody have are, um, there's the healthcare document, the patient advocate, and I've reduced it down to a three-page document. Now, that's not the document that you'd receive if you come in and, and hire us and we're going to do a full comprehensive plan. It does not substitute for real legal planning. But I figured, okay, we get at least the basics and we got it down to three pages and we think that most people will be able to, to fill it in. But there's two really key points here. It has to be witnessed by two people. Notary doesn't matter. It has to be witnessed by two people has to be witnessed by two people who are not relatives in any way. Basically, can't, you say, well, my son-in-law is not really a relative. No, your son-in-law is a relative under this rule. Can't be witnessed by any relatives. Okay, grandkids, great grandkids can't be witnessed by a relative, right? Number one. Number two is it can't be witnessed by a caregiver or anybody that works for a caregiver. So it can't be witnessed by hospital employees. Can't be witnessed by your caregiver that comes by the house. Can't be witnessed by anybody that works for uh, you know one of the healthcare organizations and so that's really important so if you if there's a way that you have an ability to have this signed by basically strangers we've got these documents in uh, in the meantime hopefully we'll be able to help you sign those documents now you will have to have a quick um, you know conversation and we're going to uh, cons consult with you briefly on it and then hopefully we'll be able to help you sign those Again, I really hope you don't take advantage of this. I really hope that you understand these are just temporary documents to, uh, to because we just want to help. We want to help, you know, if there's healthcare workers out there and things like that, and they, they just need to have something in place uh, and others that just truly can't afford legal services. I don't know what's going on with the, with the you know, legal services uh, uh, out there right now. So if you just can't afford legal services, please take advantage of this. But for everybody else, I really hope that you say, no, this is important that we don't want to just have basic fill in the blank forms. We want to have a real plan, a comprehensive plan that covers more than just healthcare decisions. Okay. The second document that I think everybody needs is that HIPAA waiver. And like I said, they've waived a lot of those laws, uh, the HIPAA law, but uh, I think you still need it in place so that you can say, these are the people that I want you to be able to share my medical information with, and they can ask questions and they can get information you know, over the phone and things like that. So those are the two free legal documents that we're offering. And I, again, I highly recommend, I'll, I'll tell you, this is something um, when it comes right down to, well, let's, let's what should you do now? So uh, Savannah is going to come on in a minute and we'll maybe go through some questions and then she's going to wrap up by telling you about the methods that you can interact with us, how we can do work for you now. And there's two things I really want to uh, have you think about this. Um, certainly, if you're an existing client and you have some updates, we can help you with that, uh, especially if we get this governor's order, we can help you with that. We can make sure that you've got updates. We'll take care of that. Um, but many of you that our existing clients have said uh, for years, oh, I really need to have my daughter come in, or I really need to have my son, or I need to have my neighbor, or I need to have my brother come in. Now is, uh, now is the time for several reasons. Number one is a lot of people are working from home. They've got a little extra time and they can actually do it where they have, you know, in a normal situation, they, they, they struggle to, to find time for it and we can get it done. We'll make it work. Number two is that, uh, you know, boy, I don't know what's going to happen with this virus thing. And so if they don't have those documents in place or they're not up to date, you know, get them in here, please. 
Um, and the third thing is, you know, frankly, this has been something that we need to, we need business right now. I'm, I'm, I'm being serious about this and we do a really good job. We've worked with a lot of you for years um, and we need uh, the business right now. They've, they, you know, we're, we're complying with all the orders, we're doing all the things, um, but this is going to be very challenging. And I've never once, I've had my own law firm for 20 years and I've never once um, worried about payroll. Uh, I've never had, had a need for that. And I'm not that worried right now, except for the fact that I don't know how long this is going to go on for. So anybody that has been thinking about it and you're, you, you know, we're going to give you an option for us to just kind of interview us. It's not going to cost you anything to interview us, go through the process. We'll ask you some questions. One of the things we're going to do a little bit differently is we're going to send you out a questionnaire. And if you feel comfortable filling out that questionnaire, even before your first phone call, that'll just kind of streamline that process. So that would be kind of a, a neat little thing. Now, if you're not comfortable filling that out until you've interviewed us, that's perfectly okay. We can go with that too, but we're trying to make this as easy for everybody as possible. But if you've got people that you know that you've been wanting to get in, or if you are on the call today and you, you haven't worked with us previously, uh, it's time. It's time to get this done. We, we will uh, make sure it gets done. You, they're gonna have three ways to uh, interact with us. You can just go ahead and schedule. We're gonna do these little 15 minute interviews and the 15 minute interviews that you're gonna schedule, you just go onto the calendar and you schedule it at whatever time is convenient for you. Those are for us to figure out what you need and who you need to meet with because we've got different lawyers, different people in the office for different circumstances. So that's those 15 minute interviews are designed for us to figure out whether you want to interact with us, whether you want to hire us, uh, but also whether or not, uh, you know, which of the lawyers you need to meet with and things like that. If you can, we'll send you that form and you can fill that out even before that 15 minute interview um, and you feel comfortable with that, you send that to us. It'll help us speed that up and we'll be able to make sure that we, we get what you need. Uh, you also could just, uh, we're going to give you a button to click and you can click the button and it's just going to send us an email and we'll be able to interact with you that way. And of course, phones. Now, phones are a possibility. It's just that uh, we're, we're a little bit limited on phones because everybody's working remotely. So if more than one or two people are calling at the same time, it's probably going to go to voicemail. So it might ring a few more extra times to be aware of that, and, and but we'll make sure we'll take care of it. Savannah, if you want to come back on and if I don't know if there's any quick questions we can answer and then you can kind of give some instructions. Yeah, thank you, Bob. So right now, I don't see any questions. If anyone does have anything that they would like to ask, I encourage you to use the chat box. Just go ahead and place that question in the chat and uh, we'll see it now before the meeting wraps up today. Um, if you don't feel comfortable typing into the chat box, as Bob mentioned, you will be getting an email soon. Um, one of the options is to just contact us. You can click that button. I very clearly told you which button to push if you just want to sort of ask us a question or maybe there's just something you'd like to know. Um, you're more than welcome to do that um, in the email that I send you um, with the contact us. Um, also in that email, as Bob mentioned, I'll be giving you um, a link that you can schedule your own interview or intake appointment. Um, you'll pick the time that you would like to have one of our uh, representatives give you a call. We'll just discuss some very important key details, find out what your concerns are, um, and how we can help you best with the right staff member in the office. As Bob mentioned, we have a number of attorneys, so we just wanna make sure that we pair you with the, the best person for your needs. Um, we'll also be sending um, a replay of today's webinar. You won't get that today. Um, it just takes a little bit of time to process the recording and all of that good stuff. So we'll be sending that out by Friday. Um, you'll get that replay. You'll be able to watch this again, share the replay with your friends, your family, um, you know, try to pass the word along. As Bob said, a lot of people could really use this help right now. So um, we want to make sure. Cut that... in right there. I know I talk really fast for those of you that are saying I talk really fast, but that's why we send the replay. So you can watch it back and repeat it and slow it down and, and do all of that. So, but yes, please share it with others too. Thank you. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Um, and of course, we are going to try to do this every Wednesday, webinar Wednesday. So stay tuned. We will have a, another email coming to you um, that'll have a link for you to register for next week's webinar. We'll tell you what we're talking about, um, and we hope to see you there. Um, and lastly, as Bob mentioned, uh, we know that we are working remotely. We have this no, uh, you know, social distancing requirements and all of that. So um, I know he mentioned this, but I just wanted to say again, we can meet with you any way that you feel comfortable. 
whether it's by the phone, whether you feel comfortable doing a video chat, we can do that in a number of ways. Facebook Messenger, um, Google Hangout, if you have an iPhone, we can FaceTime. Um, I mean, we can even do Snapchat if you're comfortable with Snapchat. There's all different kinds of ways. <laughs> Um, so yes, don't don't let that be a barrier. Um, you know, it's kind of fun figuring out all these different ways to talk to you. So um, if you have an idea, if there's something that we haven't mentioned, feel free to reach out using the contact us button. Um, so I'll go ahead and wrap up my part. Um, if there's anything that Bob thinks I need to mention, um, go ahead and do that now, Bob. Otherwise, I'll wrap this up so I can get that email out to you all. Yeah, no, I just appreciate everybody coming on and listening. Uh, there is overwhelming response to uh, this. Yeah, I think we only posted it a couple days ago and uh, overwhelming response. So I just want to say I appreciate all you guys. I uh, appreciate you listening. I appreciate all of our clients that have been with us for all these years and know that we're here to take care of you. I think that's it. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up then.